What is the importance of a price system and a free market economy? Join Richard Eveline and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's Libertarian Angle, the show that you all know brings you the principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy and has for quite a few years now. And uh, I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Ebeling, professor of economics at the Citadel, who also has quite a few years now advocated this principled and compromising case for libertarianism. Richard, good to see you again. It's good to be back with you, of course, and to be with our viewers and listeners once more. Yeah. So, Richard, you know, over the years, you and I have discussed various facets of the market economy, a genuine free market system as compared to what is commonly described as a free market system under which we live. But one of the aspects that I don't think we've ever discussed is one of the most important aspects of the market economy, and that's the price system. So I figured, you know, let's let's devote a segment to the price system because it, it sort of is one of the features of a market economy, I think, that is just taken for granted. It's just, okay, yeah, people set prices, you go into stores and there's a price tag on there, you decide whether you want to buy it. But actually, as, as Hayek pointed out, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises and the Austrian School, as well as Milton Friedman and other free market economists have pointed out, the price system is really an intricate part of a market economy and an essential part of a market economy. And so let me let me just throw out one of the perspectives on this. And you're you're obviously much more proficient in this area than I am being an Austrian economist. But to me, prices communicate information that they're really the means by which people communicate in the market economy. Uh, they people can make rational decisions based on what prices are, both in the manufacturing field as well as the the uh, consumer field. Uh, one of the, the best examples, I think, of this phenomenon is what happens when an area is hit by a natural disaster, let's say like a hurricane. Well, immediately the price of bottled water skyrockets. Let's say that people were just unprepared for this. And it goes to, let's say, a dollar a bottle to $25 a bottle. Well, Immediately, that communicates information. It tells prospective suppliers around the country, the, this area needs, needs uh, water. And, and nobody has to know all the reasons and the facets as to why they need water or what the situation is. All they see is that price tag. And they say, huh, if I can figure out a way to get water into that area, I'm going to make a big profit. Uh, now, of course, there may be people doing it also just for charitable reasons. Hey, people need water. I'm going to try, try to get some water in there and provide it for free or at a low price or whatever. But in terms of profit making, that price is a signal. You want to make a profit, get water in there. And that, of course, helps out people by virtue of the new supply of water coming in. Prices start to drop because of the additional supply. But it's also a signal to consumers in that affected area. And it's, it's a signal that says, you need to conserve water. You know, no more car washing right now. Uh, you, you need to conserve water very, very carefully because water is scarce. Now, what happens inevitably, though, is that government officials interfere with this, this communicative uh, uh, method of, of uh, the price system. Uh, they say, oh, this is terrible. There's price gouging. We need to establish a law that, that or enact a law or a decree that puts a ceiling on what people can charge. Well, now they've tampered with this information communicating method of the price system. They, they, they say, for example, let's say that they say that the price can't exceed $5 a bottle. Well, now the People say, oh, well, I don't need to conserve after all. I mean, it's, hey, you know, it's only $5, no problem. And then entrepreneurs out there in the, uh, in the rest of the country say, well, shoot, I'm not going to take much time to go in there to sell a bottle for $5. And so that, that interference by the state with this communication system of the marketplace actually makes things worse for people. 
So that's my introduction to the to the price system. I'll turn it over to you now to give your perspective of this intricate and essential part of the market economy. Yeah, look, look, before I sort of get into some things I'd like to sort of amplify, let me use your example here, which I think is an important one. You know, so suddenly in a, in a national disaster, you know, floods, a hurricane, a, a earthquake, uh, you're right. You know, suddenly in the disaster area, prices rise. People are shocked by this. But that higher price is is telling people something. An analogy, okay, obviously not a one to one, but an analogy is y you're in a factory, and there's always noises going on, the machine, people are talking, whatever. And suddenly the, 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 there's one of the emergency signals that go off. Now, at first, you may not know what the problem is. Has a machine broke down? Has someone got his arm caught in a machine? Has there been a, an explosion or a damage of some sort? And it's irritating, right? It's irritating. Turn that off. But you don't want to turn it off. You don't want to turn it off because it's telling people that something unusual, abnormal, serious, dangerous has occurred. And where the sound might be most intense is where you want people to be drawing. Is someone hurt? Do we have to turn a valve off? Is do we need to get the fire extinguishers going? You don't know this unless you allow the signal to work. And that's the same thing in an emergency. Prices must rise to be an informational source to people. In this area, there's an abnormality going on, an earthquake, a hurricane, a flood, some type of a disaster, for instance. And there's an unusual need on the part of people for certain things that are now not available. They've been destroyed. Uh, they've been cut off from their normal supplies, whatever the reason. We need emergency equipment because people are under the rubble of an earthquake, like just happened in, in Taiwan uh, yesterday or last night. And uh, you, you want those signals to be telling you this because it's, it's saying something is needed somewhere. We don't know why, but that signal is telling us that this is needed, this is needed, this is needed, and we want to draw it. But that argument is sort of builds upon something more general, which is I'd like to take a few minutes to discuss. Uh, you had mentioned Hayek. Now, he's famous for his essay, A Use of Knowledge in Society, The Use of Knowledge in Society, originally published in the American Economic Review in September of 1945. And in this, he reminded people that uh, besides the division of labor, there's a division of knowledge. There's the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. And not surprisingly, each of these people know things that the others don't. The person who specializes as a baker knows how to knead the bread and add the yeast and how long it needs to be in the oven and at what temperature and for how long. Uh, the, the candlestick maker knows how to take wax, mold it into a shape, get the, the string wick into it uh, and properly put it in so it will burn evenly and thoroughly. Uh, the butcher knows how to carve up meat and to, to see that it's taken care of and that it's less disease-like and so on and so forth. So it's obviously there's different, different knowledges uh, with, with a division of labor. But Hayek's point is that the very nature of a, of a social system in division of labor is that inevitably people know many, many things that others don't. Knowledge is decentralized, dispersed, divided among all the people of the society in little bits of different types. And he talked about three types of knowledge. First, there's scholarly or reading or scientific knowledge, the kind of knowledge that a, a lawyer learns when he goes to law school. Certainly, it, it serves the client well, Jacob, because you were trained as a lawyer. When the lawyer has gone to law school and knows how to present evidence in a court, make an objection, prepare a brief, and so on, uh, just as it is useful for a medical doctor to have gone to law school and done a lot of studying, uh, work in, 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 in a hospital or, or in the practice rooms uh, uh, on a cadaver, how do you make an incision? What are you looking for? What are the symptoms? Most of that is just read out of books. All of those are important forms of knowledge in the division of labor, which we hope someone, when we don't have it, has that knowledge, which they can, we, which we can acquire by hiring their services. But I also said there's a second type of knowledge, and this is the knowledge of specific time and place. This is the kind of knowledge that no matter what you read or how knowledgeable you are in the scientific sense, this is the kind of knowledge you only learn on the spot. 
in the particular circumstances that you find yourself in the in that corner of the world that that niche of the division of labor in which you are situated the particular people you're working with or who surround you in certain social settings who are they what do they know what are their personalities like how, how what are the rules the unwritten rules of psychology of how you properly interact with them not to create problems to get things done uh, who can do what where when what machines are working what has a glitch in it because we're in a factory and things have to be taken care of all this localized knowledge of time and place and then finally Hayek talked about a third knowledge which he called tacit or inarticulate knowledge this is the kind of knowledge that a person acquires and they know how to do it when to do it why it needs to be done but would be very difficult or quote impossible to always put into a verbal or written form to share or explain or to give to another um, the standard examples are you know how did you learn to ride a bike most parents did not give their little kid a booklet a how-to booklet here's how you ride a bike now go play out in the traffic you had someone who, who helped you balance yourself on the bicycle told how told you vaguely generally how you should be moving the handlebars balancing your weight on the seat you know so you don't fall over in one direction or another or you take a corner you're going downhill and guess what you fell down many more than one time until you sort of just intuitively learn the ability to ride a bike how, how does a specialist in some area it could be a mechanic to a brain surgeon just sort of sense something oh this has to be done this is what it's telling me and it would be very difficult always for people to to explain it in words it's just sort of a knowledge that they tacitly have acquired appreciate and know and have had enough experience with it when to use it how to use it why to use it and how it will solve a problem now these three types of knowledge are kinds of knowledge that all of us possess in layers interactive and interconnected layers and it's constantly changing because every day is in principle a little bit different than yesterday so you learn new things you experience new things you acquire different types of these interactive type forms of knowledge so all of this type of multi-layered interconnecting ever-changing knowledge is divided among all of us and by all of us i mean since we're now in a worldwide social and economic setting uh, a world of over eight billion people now think of all the knowledge you have of even these three types that i just was alluding to and compare the knowledge you possess to all the other knowledge that's in the heads of all the other people in the world you and i and even jacob hornberger is extremely ignorant uninformed a dummy but don't feel embarrassed don't feel ashamed don't think that you're somehow inferior the fact is that's the very no nature of the human circumstance in any degree of complexity in the world which we have today now if all of this knowledge is divided and dispersed around the entire world in the way I'm suggesting which is really just how Hayek was suggesting how do we take advantage of what others know could do for us how can they take advantage of what we know and we could do for them in this mutual positive interconnected way well Hayek's answer to this was we don't have to plan it we don't have to design it we don't have to command it we don't have to control it from some center all of this knowledge which no one mind group of minds the greatest Nobel Prize winners of the world could ever effectively and completely and efficiently master and combine everybody can have their little knowledges of these different types in all their places around the entire globe and we can be bound together through speaking to each other not in the usual way think of speaking like I'm talking to you and Jacob was just talking a minute ago to convey an idea a thought uh, or a written form like the books behind Jacob and the books behind me it's the communication of the price mechanism Hayek said that through prices we as consumers tell potential suppliers and producers what it is we want the degree of importance in terms of the price we're willing to offer that we place upon it all the suppliers in all the corners of, of of the division of labor making all the conceivable manufactured goods services et cetera et cetera inform us through what they tell us through the prices what could I do 
what might I be willing to do for you at a price sufficient to make it worth my while, which means compared to other things I could do with my time or devoting my energies to making a different product in the division I agree to satisfy Joe instead of you, Sam. What are my opportunity costs, which I express through the price at which I'd be willing to produce and supply? Everybody comes together. And through the movements and the changes of these prices, the coordination occurs that we see out there in the world. As, as Frederick Bastiat rhetorically said in one of his essays 150 years ago, how does Paris get fed? There's no central planner, so central director, no commander, no drill sergeant. No, Paris gets fed because prices are informing everyone. What some want, others can do. So the bread is there, the shoes are there, the meat is there, and so on and so forth. All through this magical miracle of the price system, which no one designs, no one commands, no one implements, it just spontaneously emerges through the market. You know, the example that you started with, Jacob, about the emergency and governments coming in and capping the price to prevent it from telling the truth of these emergency circumstances led me to once write an article called Price Controls Attack Freedom of Speech. Because when the government imposes a price cap or even a price minimum, it doesn't it could be a maximum price or a minimum price, both are forms of controlling what the prices are allowed to convey. But when it does, particularly in this case of a, of a price maximum, what it's basically preventing is people to tell their fellow human beings with a degree of urgency, as you said, I need water. There's been a destruction of our water supplies. The, the, the regular suppliers of, of bottled water in the stores, their stores got destroyed. I can't get their bottled water. The, the, the inventory is gone. Or we need food. We, we, we need some digging equipment to help people uh, you know, get, get from under the rubble. Our house has been destroyed. We need a place to stay. Uh, I'd be willing to pay this to, to even have a tent to, to, to be out of the elements for a while until things can get back in order. Unless the prices can tell the truth, we can't tell others what our circumstances are. The mundane every, every day taken advantage ones or taken for granted ones, but also these types of emergency situations. Prices have work to do. And their prices is to tell the truth. And unless we allow prices to tell that truth, we cannot have the degree of complexity and adaptability and efficiency and promptness that we take for granted in everyday ways, but are essential, particularly when dramatic changes occur. Prices are essential to the complexity and the, and the existence of the market that we take for granted, without which the society stagnates and collapses. And I, one more point here, Jacob, building on this. This is the reason why Ludwig von Mises, a hundred years ago, now more than a hundred years ago, made his first challenge against socialist central planning. If the government nationalizes the means of production, uh, uh, ends market competition because there's nothing to buy and sell, because the government owns all the major means of production, land, capital, resources, and there's no longer prices expressing what people think resources are worth, labor services are worth, what products are desired, how best to do something, what combination of resources and value terms would minimize the expense of getting certain things done compared to a more expensive way. Socialism eliminates the price system. If price controls are gags, <laughs> I haven't been able to tell you what I'm trying to say. Socialism basically put super glue over everyone's mouth, super glue, and prevents people from ever talking to each other with honesty and urgency ever again. That's why there is, in the long run, no alternative to a functioning, opening, competitive price system, which requires freedom of choice by consumers and producers, which means everyone in our different consumer and producer roles in the division of labor, private property, so things can legally and openly and honestly be bought and sold. Well, this is what I think it's worth. This is what it will. I might be willing to sell it for. And to allow these prices to adapt and adjust to bring about the coordination that gives us the standards of living and the quality of life and the ease of adaptability to inescapable changing circumstances that we take for granted each and every day. Yeah, that's a very nice analysis of the prices, especially in the context of Hayek's concept of the 
the use of knowledge in society. And, you know, I, I want to emphasize, though, that, you know, in this in this uh, hurricane business that there's, you know, inevitably people that condemn the the profit seeking entrepreneur who's bringing in the bottle and selling it for twenty dollars. And, you know, it's fine that people are there's people out there that are going to do it for free because they want to help out others. But the market economy provides a price system where by people seeking their own self-interest, seeking a big profit, they are serving others. We often forget that you can condemn them all you want, but they're the ones bringing in the in the in the water and sometimes risking their lives to get that water in there to make a profit. In the process of seeking their own profit, they're over there serving others by bringing bringing water in there. The other thing, Richard, is that you know the the person that sees a price shooting up doesn't really need to know the reasons for why that's happening. You know, let's say a a business is is um, has run out of a very critical part in its manufacturing business. All of a sudden, it zooms up that price from a hundred dollars a part to a thousand dollars a part. Well, somebody way over in the other part of the world, you know, Timbuktu, he doesn't need to get on the phone and say, "What's going on with your business? I need to know all the ramifications." All he needs to know is that price is now zoomed up to a thousand dollars, and he says, "I'm going into production. I'm going to get that thousand dollars." And that's the beauty of the price system is that it it communicates information and the person doesn't need, need to know the reasons for why the prices are rising. He just sees the price rise and says, I'm going to respond to it. We also see this phenomenon in the immigration area where people say, oh, well, these people are coming in without invitation. They, they don't have a you know formally engraved in, invitation from some employer. Well, what they don't recognize is that the price system is an invitation. When and when a farmer in Oregon has his fields rotting out there because he doesn't have enough farm workers, he zooms the price of labor from $10 an hour to $50 an hour, plus room and board, uh, plus transportation. The worker in Mexico gets wind of this and says, my gosh, this is incredible. He didn't need to know what the heck's going on on that farm. He just gets on the bus and heads on up there, and all of a sudden you've got a flood of workers that are harvesting this guy's crop at $50 an hour. So again, it communicates information. Uh, your, your point about what was called the socialist calculation debate is fantastic. When, when the government owns everything, there are no prices because there's no nobody's trading things. Prices come into existence because people own private property, and they're exchanging that property for other people's private property. When the state owns everything, there are no prices in that system because there, the, you don't have exchanges. And so there's no means of calculation. And this was what Mises said. You have nothing but chaos in a socialist system. And uh, uh, so this is a remarkable system, Richard. It's an absolutely phenomenal system. I want to make one final point, and I'll hand it back to you. And that's the Federal Reserve. That... By tampering with this, this price system through inflating the money supply, the paper money supply, they tamper, they, they really damage this communication system because it's very difficult for me, people to make calculations when the system itself, the price system, is being corrupted and polluted by what the Fed is doing. And that's why the, 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 the ideal is to get government entirely out of the monetary sphere to a certain, extent, a certain extent, the gold standard did that because the government could not print gold coins. Uh, but the ideal is um, what Hayek called the denationalization of money, the separation of money in the state, so that the price system can, can operate unhampered by government uh, ability to destroy or damage the money supply by its tampering. I want to pick up on uh, the example or the, that you used a moment ago is that what if a firm suddenly is short of something that they need there uh, some input some some resource some raw material the component part uh, the price system immediately tells that there's a shortage people respond to improvisation is very important that emerges through a price signal now perhaps some of the viewers and listeners remember just 2020 when when there, there emerged the panic about the covid crisis and there suddenly were these greater number of people than normally showing up for medical treatment in clinics, hospitals, and they were running out of not just beds, but respirators. And, and so what immediately happened? 
the shortage of available respirators resulted in the price rising and the improvisation. You saw companies that made product X devise ways to make a temporary type of respirator just as workable as the, quote, the official and normal respirators. Now, what was the government's response? Well, the Food and Drug Administration, the regulators said, oh, no, you can't offer to market a respirator that has not has a design or a structure or component parts other than the ones that we, the government, have approved. Yeah, people are gasping for breath in the hospital, but oh, no, we can't let someone improvise with a substitute because it doesn't meet the government standard rules. Oh, you died? Well, that's life. And the other thing is the incentive to try to do this. The incentive to try to do this because the price rose because suddenly there was this huge demand for either the standard uh, respirators or these improvised alternatives and substitutes that were just were as workable to keep a pre person breathing. Because I'll tell you, losing your breath can take the, the real life out of things. All right. Well, you reminded me also of the mask phenomenon uh, and setting aside whether masks are good or not good or whatever, t totally separate debate. There was a high demand for masks and uh, people couldn't get them. And you immediately had the private sector improvising uh, in response to the to the high prices of masks. They were they let's shift our production over to the production of masks with designs on them and so forth. A classic example of where the price system is telling people this is what consumers want for right or wrong you need to produce this i just mentioned that uh, because of those uh, scarcities of masks during that COVID crisis uh, it created unusual situations um, here where i live in south carolina uh, a, a bank robber had gone in to rob a bank the police showed up and they realized they were going to have to arrest him because he had tried to rob the bank without a mask that's just pathetic, Richard. I mean, I, I know we're out of time, but I'm so reluctant to end the show on that <laughs> note. <laughs> uh, darn. Well, I, I guess we probably should. I'm speechless in that one, to be honest with you. I got nothing else to say. So we might as well wrap it up. Um, as always, I greatly enjoy the show, including your insightful, eloquent remark there at the end. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for tuning in. If you're new to FFF, come and visit us at FFF.org for 34 years of, of articles along the lines we've talked about today. And uh, from a principled uh, libertarian perspective, uh, come and uh, subscribe to our FFF Daily, uh, which we've published now for many years. And uh, Richard, I enjoyed the conversation as always, and I look forward to talking to you next week. Until next time. <laughs>